All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Coffee is for Closers. Today, myself and James, no Ryan Sirhan guest today. Unfortunately, no. He asked to come back, but I said no. Yeah, we didn't want to, like, water down the other episodes by just having him on repeat appearances. Yeah. It just didn't seem fair to our other guests, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. All right, today, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about objections, objection handling, why we get objections, where they come from, why the noises that come out of your face are affecting them or causing them. So let's hear the intro. If you listen to this podcast, you will make your first million within three years. I'm going to repeat that. You will make a million dollars within three years of the first episode you listen to. We don't want pikers. We're not here to save the manatees. We're here to make podcasts. You really want this. You listen and review. Put that coffee down. Yeah. uh, So objections. uh, Objections. Yeah. I object. (laughs) Sustained. So we're going to be talking about objections. One of the key things in getting better at sales is understanding not only how to overcome objections, but where they come from. And we have to have the realization that we are inducing each objection because like sales conversations are different regardless of they're all different depending on who's having them. And so I might do that sales call and that person might have a think about it objection. James might do it and they might have a partner objection. Marco might do it. They might have a think about it objection, right? They're all, they're all different because we are essentially either normalizing a certain way of thinking, causing a certain way of thinking. Or we haven't pre-framed something well enough or set itself well enough to where we're not in a position to be able to handle something. So Seems that's the end of the podcast. Sorry, guys. Thanks for coming. Uh, so, <laughs> just, <laughs> that, that was really good information. Now, what do we do with that information? Right. I haven't figured that part out yet. I've only gotten as far as diagnosing. Diagnosing? <laughs> no, no, no. So what we have to do is we have to work our way backwards, right? So what people need to realize is that if you have – like a kink in a, if you have a hose that isn't working, you unkink the one closest to, to the, the tap. tap. Yes. Okay. And so you always want to like work your way, try and start at the beginning. So if you're getting, first of all, you need to track your objections. That's really important. And not many people do that. I speak to a lot of companies and nobody tracks objections. And as an, an individual sales rep level, you need to track objections mm-hmm. because you need to know where you need to develop. Exactly. And, and if you don't understand what you need, what you're getting most of the time, then you're going to be going on feel. And you're only going to remember certain things. It's like your memory is flawed. And I'm pretty sure that this is a true stat from the CIA from when I was doing like interrogation stuff. True stat from what he can remember. Yeah. If you're asked any more than eight questions about a specific thing, about a memory, then your memory is now uh, being influenced by the questions. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, what's the name? I of either bias? got that on a resistance to interrogation training or a sword and MacGyver. There's a, a particular name for it in terms of like the biases that's provided. I completely forget what it was, but it's a normal thing. Like if I do a personality test, I will, I know what my personality You'll is. Fail. I will answer the question specifically knowing what the end state is. Confirmation for bias. Me. It, it's, it's a more specific type of bias. It's, it's not confirmation, but there's a, there's a very specific term for it. I can't, it, good look, right? We'll come back to it. It's not confirmation bias. Okay. It's confirmation bias. <laughs> That's confirmation bias. <laughs> that what you just said there is confirmation bias. That's the perfect example of confirmation bias. And so it comes back to you have to track your objections. Like there, it really, it, it frustrates me a little bit when I'm speaking to salespeople because I'm like, what are you bad at? Mm. And they, they don't really know. And mm. it's not the fact that they don't have access to the information, it's just that they don't like do the things required to know the information. And I think that's why, because my brain specifically is a, I'm a problem solver. Like yeah. that's my, that's like puzzles, um, anything where I have to work something out. I really enjoy it. Yeah. I love it. I always yeah. happen that way. So for me, when I was, or when I sell and when I am selling, I have a look at like, what outcomes am I getting? What am I doing to cause that? And that's a key distinction where you understand, like, I put up a survey today in our Facebook group called The Closing Code, and I was like, what's stopping you from doubling your sales, right, next month? And I put a couple of traps in there because it was like understanding your sales process. I don't know how to handle objections. One of them was like, I don't have enough leads, Mm. right? And overwhelmingly, people say, I don't have enough leads. Like, well, that's not true because one, you can... 
if you sold everybody, you'd double your sales. So, like, there you go. But also, like, you do have enough leads. You just don't know how to access them usually. Yeah. But, like, people don't really take the time to understand what they're bad at and then fix that. Because if you get a lot of – but if you don't know that you overwhelmingly get think about it, objections uh-huh. and you can't overcome those – or even weirder, if you overwhelmingly get thinking about it, objections, but you do overcome them, you still need to work on that because you're causing Introducing it. That. So yeah. there's a double-edged sword there, right? Because one, the guys, they need to understand what objection that they're not doing well at to get better at that. Yeah. But before they can even do that, they need to understand that is the objection they're getting what they think it is? Right. right, because I have so many times, like, a guy comes up, I need help with this objection. We role play it, listen to the call. It's like, that's not the objection. You're handling the wrong objection. They've said X, Y, Z, which doesn't actually respond to the objection. You're just perceiving it that way because you haven't dug deep enough or you haven't got the real pain point, yeah. and it's a smokescreen. So yeah. where do you start with that? Well, the big thing, and this is the reason... If you're don't if you're not as successful as you want to be in sales, and I don't think anybody truly is, because everyone wants to be more successful. Yeah. But if you're not what you would be considered, like I consider myself a successful salesperson, mm-hmm. I can be better in a lot of areas. Oh yeah, but I'm a successful salesperson, right? The biggest problem with most salespeople is that their internal monologue is too loud. So you know when you're in a conversation with somebody and you know that person is like truly listening, like Ben, our operations manager, listens very well. When you when you talk to him, you're the only person alive. It's like there's that thing, right? Mm-hmm. That means that you will. There's a different way in which you interact with that person, and mm-hmm. you're much more honest and open mm-hmm. with them, and you trust them much more. Mm-hmm. A lot of salespeople they don't do the work to understand their script, yes. right? And so instead of listening to the prospect, they're waiting to say the next thing, which means they miss all of the key things that are being said, yep. and then they interpret things incorrectly. And they induce a lot of sales resistance because they handle the wrong thing. They're, yeah, they're just not listening. And so it's really frustrating because, like, from my perspective, I just go, well, like, when I was trying to learn my new script, I read it like four or 500 times. Mm-hmm. I printed it out and I just read it a lot. And I, for a while, I didn't really even understand how it went together. I just didn't get it. I was like, okay, but. I kind of memorized it and I was like, okay, now I can just kind of roll through it. Yeah. And then as I started to understand like the structure better, I started to understand how it flowed and then I could be really conversational in how I mm-hmm. did it. And then it just became automatic. And once it became automatic, then I could start really listening to the prospect like really intently and picking up on every little bit of detail and asking the right, like clarifying at the right points, probing at the right yep. points. And that's when the person knew I was truly listening to them. And then the conversation became really different. Like yes. it became very open, honest, for me, very predictable in what was going to happen. And the real reason was for that is because I really understand where I'm trying to take the sale. Persist. And then like, you know what objections you're going to get. And yeah. then you know how to pre-handle them so you can handle them effectively. But it's like reading the script and being able to memorize that word for word is a different thing from understanding what am I saying this line for? What's the purpose yeah. of this question to facilitate this specific answer? So I can ask that question in 10 different ways as long as I know I'm getting to the answer. Therefore, I can move things in the script based on the conversation. Yeah, but I think you have to memorize it. Absolutely. So I think like memorizing is easy. Mm-hmm. Like it's just work. Mm. You just got to read it a lot. Then from there, like you get the coaching and then you start to understand and yep. ask questions. And yep. then it's like, but it's all kind of like, it's a cycle. You can't just memorizing it isn't enough. No. Just understanding it's it not isn't enough. enough. You have to know where you are and know where you're going. And then the more you understand it, the more you know where you are and where you're going the more you can go off script but Mm. still be on script. Absolutely. Now, going back to your point about listening, there is a huge distinction between listening and, like, actually actively listening. listening. So hearing and listening, right? And you can see, like, with Ben, you can feel the focus is on what you're saying, Mm. right, as an example. But with typically a lot of more junior sales reps, you can see them when you're speaking. The The thoughts go through their head. They're just like... Ah, oh, cool. They're like ready to pounce, which yeah. I'm, I'm guilty of. I do it to you all the time, right? I think a lot of people do. But I also heavily listen. Like I'm very intentional with trying to understand. I have a very good skill set of being un- 
able to understand and find points which people miss with words that people say. Right? But that's also coming from an understanding of behavior at the same time. So like you can literally see people trying to think and ready to butt in and ready to say the next word or basically come in with that next line to pre-handle. And I see that a lot with when we teach um, guys to interrupt, right? Particularly when they're learning how to interrupt people, they're sitting there ready to pounce in to talk over the top of someone because they're looking for that opportunity to butt in when you really shouldn't. You should feel, oh, this is pointless. I'm going to jump in now. You shouldn't need to be thinking and looking for the opportunity to say the next thing. It should come naturally. And that comes from, one, learning the script, but also learning where you're going with it and why. It's an excellent point. Like, people, you see it all the time, like, when you meet, like, a narcissist or something like that, and Mm. it's like, every answer you give, like saying things and they're just, they're waiting for you to stop or they're waiting for a moment where they can interject their next point. And it's borderline just like they're not even listening. You have to say things over and over again, stuff like that, which is really, really frustrating. And from what I hear in a lot of sales calls that I listen to, they're not listening. It's not because they don't want to, or they're trying to be that way, but it's just, I can almost hear their internal monologue of Mm. trying to figure out like how to get this back on track. And that's a big thing. And I can usually tell in the first six minutes of a sales call that I listen to if it's closed or not. And I can normally get the objection correct. Mm -hmm. So I usually say this is a think about it objection incorrect. Like Mm -hmm. you didn't close. Yeah. Yeah, Right. And the reason is because like, most sales calls go off the rails early and then they just don't get back on track. Yep. And that's a symptom of someone not understanding the levels they're trying to take people through, not being able to incorrect, like interrupt correctly, not being able to reestablish their like authority on the call. And then from there, it just goes down a pathway where you're just like having a chat with somebody. Yeah. And that's not purposeful. There's no intent behind that. And that's not going to be able to get a sale. And it's almost always going to induce a money objection, think about it, a partner objection, something, because I would say like 70 to 80 percent of objections are more smokescreen than they are objection. Mm-hmm. They're more of a fear base, especially in the coaching space, like more specifically in the coaching space. But I think generally in sales like wide, wider, people are just scared to move forward because like people are scared to spend money. Oh, yeah. And like, you know, I'm a big believer. Yeah, I'm a big believer that scared money makes no money. Mm -hmm. Um, But people really are scared to spend money. And that's fair enough, I suppose. It's not my mentality, but I'm sure it has been. It definitely has been. But yeah, and so like a lot of sales is just simply talking it through with somebody and getting them out of their own way. That that really is what most objection handling is. Mm. And having a process that you can take people through that consistently gets them out of their own way. Yeah. I think that's the big difference as well between collaborative objection handling versus combative objection handling. And I've done my fair share of combative objection handling. It's, I would say, easier to do. It requires less skills. 100%. But it's nowhere near as effective and it's mentally draining. Anyone can steamroll another person. Yeah, it's not hard. But... Should you, right? I'm going to come back to a question that I have for you because there is a massive skill set in being able to listen to someone and understand when and when not to probe, i.e. ask a follow-up question. They say, you know, we're not getting enough leads. Enough leads. You know, we're just going deeper onto what that is. Mm -hmm. There's a very big skill set in uncovering the real problem. Now, I find a lot of less experienced sales reps miss the major problems or where to put in problem awareness and what to dig in on and what, and what not to. Yeah. How do you develop that skill? I think most people don't know what problems actually solve. Mm. Like, so like that, that's a big one. Sometimes I'll listen to sales calls and I'm just like, why would you ask that? Yeah. So do I. Like that makes no sense. And then, but you have to like, that's, I think the only way you develop that is by having someone go, well, why did you ask that? Mm. And then from there, you having to like defend your own position or to be like, oh, yeah, I see what that did. Because when I'm coaching people, when, when I, like I have my perspective training, which is once a week small group coaching with me, yeah. I will do a core review and I'll go, okay, stop. What did you hope to get from that question? Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, well, I'm trying to set this up. And I'm like, well, I think, having not heard the call, I go, I think this is what's going to happen. 
And sure enough, most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, that's what happens. It's because, like, you can hear, like, there's no benefit to asking certain questions. Yeah. And if you don't know the answer, probably don't. If you don't have a good idea of what the answer is going to be, I would not ask it. And if you don't know why you're asking that, you probably shouldn't. Yeah. And so you really have to know what problems you're solving and how to channel people mm. into those problems. Like, you know, if you're selling lead generation, you probably don't want to get in the weeds about their sales. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, if someone tells me they close at 90% and I'm selling lead gen, I will not touch that. I'll be like, okay, perfect. Happy with that answer. Mm. I know it's probably not true, but they think it's true. Yeah. So, like, I don't need to question them. Mm. But you know what I mean? And the same thing if I'm selling sales training and someone talks about how their lead generation is really good. I'll be like, perfect. I'm not going to go into how they generate leads and then okay. try and dissect numbers because that doesn't benefit me. No. And that's a very you know simple example. But a lot of the time, like you just have to think about some of the logical outcomes of what you're saying, and you can induce objections. It's almost it's easier to induce objections than it is it's to just like prehandle. Yeah, it's to prehandle. It's just it's so simple. You can just say ask one question, and it's just like oh, and it gets them thinking. You're like, man, why did you say that? It's clearly going to make them give you a money objection mm-hmm. or think about an objection or something like that. You're like, oh, what are you doing? You're expanding on problems that you can't fix. Yep. So it's like if you can't fix those problems, why would you ever talk about them? Because yeah, exactly. now then they're going to walk away from that having to think about it because, yeah, you solve one problem, but you've now caused another that exactly. you can't fix. So now, they, so now to, they go, well, which one do I solve first? I need to solve leads before I solve sales. Exactly. You know, or I need to solve sales before I solve leads. Like it, it, it's, Whatever. It, it now yeah. comes down to like a, now you've got to kind of like, I don't know, figure out how you can solve two problems or it's going to end up being a pipeline. Or, Just think about it. Yeah. That's what it turns into. Yeah. And some more, more events, right? I'll ask you this question and I'll tell you what I think the answer is because – what is your strongest objection to handle? Think about it. And I'm assuming because you're very good at getting people to take action. Yeah. Right. So I find listening to minimal amount of calls that I listen to of yours, but a very, very advanced skill of salespeople is turning the objection into the one that they're best handling. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you mostly handle things via getting people in a position where they want to take action and that action is what you're selling. Right. Yeah, I don't sell the product. I sell the actions required to, to get, get the outcome. That. And that we will guide you. We will hold you accountable to taking that action. That's our job. Yeah. And you get them to believe that you as an accountability partner and them in themselves have the ability to take said action, right, yeah. on whatever that is. Like that's your strongest one. For Marco, it's mindset. So yeah. whether that's a partner objection, whether that's a money objection, whether that's a think about it objection, he has a very good skill to turn that all into a mindset because that's what he's good at. Okay. Yeah, you use a lot of leadership. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is a point at someone's sales career where they're good enough that they can do that? It's actually just, I think, realizing that that's what you need to do. Mm. Like, I think I've done trainings on it before where I've tried to explain to people. It's like, don't get good at handling every objection. Just get good at making every objection to one that you want to handle. Yes. So it's like, you need to get rid of logistics. You have to, like, logistics is number one. So... If it's a money or a, or a timing or a partner, like logistical objection, you have to be able to tell whether it's a true logistical objection. And mm-hmm. then from there, you just handle it like you need to work with them. Mm-hmm. Like if they cannot make a decision without the business partner, like they just can't and yeah. that person isn't on the call, that's Being fine. Dead horse. You just got to go with it and you just got to make it part of your process, right? And you got to sell that person to sell on the other person or getting them on the mm-hmm. call, whatever. But then if you kind of, if the person's like, no, I'm, I can make a decision, then it's like, okay, well, now we're in like kind of, we're basically just in think about it territory. Mm. Like every objection that's not a proper partner or money or time, like is a think about it. It's all it is, right? And sometimes they might give you 17 different objections. They might go, hey, there, man, this sounds really, really good. It sounds perfect for what we want to do. I just need to make sure that I need to go and check the finances. Just make sure the partner's okay with it. So give us like 24 to 48 hours, send me an email, and I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a lot of objections. Mm-hmm. So for me, I would just go, okay, and if you did have the money, would this be the answer? I just throw away everything, go for money, because money's really easy to handle. Then I would move to partner, and then I would move to, like, a recheck to make sure it's legit. And if I, if I needed to, I would push on further and go into my perspective reframe, mm-hmm. which, is what I, which is what I go for. Mm. Because for me, it's an incredibly easy transition yep. into a perspective reframe. So I use what's called a bridge, Right, like a music term, 
right? A bridge links the chorus. And so I have a bridging question, which is like, well, that makes sense because we all make decisions based on our perspective, right? And they go, yes. And I go, perfect. You're now in my world. Now it's a action. Yeah. Now it's like, okay, sweet. Now I can just, I can stay in that world for as long as I want. I'm super comfortable there. I've done all the work. I've made all the reframes. I've had the calls, f***ed it up, done it right, to now where I'm like, man, as soon as you agree to that, it's fact or frame or whatever you want to call it. I think frame's probably good. Yeah, cool. that you, we make decisions based on our perspective, and all I have to do is get you to consider changing your perspective. Yep. Which is way easier than getting someone to give you money. And from there, they just they, ah. they tend to do it. Perspective shift. What would someone with this new perspective, what action would they take on this? They would do it. Maybe I should do it. And that's what's going on internally and yeah. within that inner dialogue, right? Yeah, and you then can you see just, that. Yeah, that and then you can just lay out, you know, different... I like stories because people put themselves in the place of the protagonist. So mm. you can talk about them without talking about them. And then you can just talk about yourself or you can talk about other people or just a, a farcical person if you want to. And they're going to kind of put themselves in the position of the main person, which is then going to allow them to go, huh, and just think a little bit differently. Because like, and this is one of the things that me when like, you know, you put ads up, whatever, and people are like, oh, I hate pushy sales people. It's like, it's, let's say in fitness, like I think you can, you can be as raucous if you want as you sell fitness, as yep. far as I'm concerned. Be like, go for your life, right? As long as you're polite to people, you can drop some velvet sledgehammers on people in fitness mm-hmm. because like if a person who's, you know, 50 years old and 40 kilos overweight and has been overweight since they were 30, that person's got 20 years of poor decision making. Of what benefit is it to them for you to like just go, okay, well, you know, you go away and think about it. For 20 years, they've made poor decisions. Yeah. What are the odds that 24 hours is going to make any fucking difference? About this much. It's zero. So it's like, no, no, no. Like there's a difference between being nice and being kind. And being kind is removing the awkwardness from yourself. Like if James had shit breath. And I just ignore it. And I know that he has shit breath. That's me being nice by not telling him something. But it's actually me not, because it's embarrassing for me to tell you, right? That's kind of like, it's awkward for me to say that. And so I'm not being, I'm not causing myself discomfort, which is not benefiting you. So I'm actually just, it's a selfish maneuver, right? Whereas if I'm being kind to you, because I care about you, I would go, hey man, your breath is shit. You should probably go fix it. Now you have an opportunity to fix the problem. Sometimes being kind just doesn't get people anywhere. It really doesn't. You just yeah. being nice. I'm saying being kind is the good one. Yeah. So, so being being nice, you're essentially just rewarding the poor behaviors of someone else by not mentioning. Exactly. Them. You know, it's like, and that, that's fine if that's the person you want to be. Yeah. But when you're in a position of leadership where your job is to convince people to be better, it's just not acceptable. Yeah. yeah, but like if you're a father or a mother or if you're a team leader or you oh, want to yeah. be, like put yourself in a state of congruence where like Absolutely. you are the guy. Like we all have friends that we go to when we need the truth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of our guys, that's me. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a good person to have because yeah. it's like you want the truth. That's how you get the feedback. That's how you get better. That's how you improve. If you just like, that's why ineffective sales guys are always like, they just can't push people. They can't take it to the next level because in reality, they don't do it themselves. Yeah. They, they wouldn't have a, a, an awkward conversation with a family member. They wouldn't have like those kind of conversations start at home. Yeah. And if you're not okay with them, you're in the wrong game. Yeah, absolutely. Like you have to my wife would be a sales savage. Right. Because she is so good at tough conversations. So good. Yeah. Like, incredibly. Like, the same as you are. You're very good at tough conversations. I am a pussy at them for like nine out of ten times, but I'm, I do it well in you sales. You do it when you need to. Yeah. Right. When you need to. I have a different, gotten better at it. I have actually. a different sales persona, but yeah, I'm getting, definitely getting better at yeah. it. Um, so yeah, like, I think if you guys are struggling with objections, what I want you guys to do, and I want you to be congruent, I want you to go and do it right now, is go into the closing code group. Right. Join that group. Right. We give away a lot of information. We do role plays. I do an hour live every single week and we talk about this stuff. And I think the key to getting better objections is one, being congruent yourself two having a plan and three, being able to carry it out with conviction. And then go download objection Objection matrix, Matrix, read and understand that, then download the core review SOP 
and start reviewing your own calls based off the objections you get and score yourself every time you do that call review based on the objections. And then you should be able to see them get better and better over time. Yeah. And if you guys want some coaching, we have coaching with me, we have coaching with the boys. Yep. uh, One-on-one. All right, guys. Thanks very much. Uh, Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only.